When I first heard about the global computer chip shortage caused by the recent global pandemic, I thought, great, that'll last a few months and then things will get back to normal. Nothing could be further from the truth. The chip shortage could last for years and has and will materially impact everything from computer production to especially auto production. It seems like everyone is cutting production forecasts, except for the likes of Tesla and Apple and companies like that. What gives? Why are these companies more immune to the chip shortage than others? Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So a lot of the facts that I'm gonna bring up here came from an extreme tech article that I recently read that was published a couple of days ago. It's got some facts in it that kind of blew my mind and so I thought they were worth passing on. But then I wanna go on and talk about how Tesla and Apple are kind of immune to this chip shortage, even though that article doesn't talk about that. So I'm gonna use a lot of the facts from the article, but then I'm going to go off on my own tangent and my own thoughts about Tesla and Apple. So let's take a look at all of this. So first of all, there have been many chip shortages before this one. Intel had a CPU shortage from 2018 to 2019. There was a GPU shortage from 2016 to 2018 and actually is still kind of ongoing. So the pandemic shortage is just another in a series of shortages that have happened over time. But of course the pandemic builds on the other chip shortages and makes them all much worse. So why these chip shortages? Well, the biggest thing that I learned from this article is that foundries are really hard to build. They take three to five years to actually build. And of course, there's many, many years of planning that have to go in before that. And the cost to build one of these foundries is 10 to $20 billion, which is kind of like, <laughs> so it makes building like a Tesla Gigafactory or something seem cheap by comparison. So as economists say, these are huge sunk costs. In other words, you have to sink all of these costs into building these foundries before you ever get a penny out of it. So you have to predict the future very well ahead of time in order to hit the right mark when you're building these foundries. Because basically you may have to predict these foundries up to 10 years ahead of when they're actually going to be able to produce something. So of course the biggest advancement we always hear about in these foundries is the die size, which is how big the little etching is that the transistors are built upon. So of course recently there was 16 nanometer and then there's 14 nanometer and now there's 10 nanometer and getting down to seven and even five nanometer die sizes, which is pretty crazy. So they're shrinking and shrinking these die sizes, which makes the processors more powerful per size and they can fit more transistors basically on the same size wafer. So of course, with every new die size, it's experimental and trying to get it to work right and trying to get it up to production is very, very difficult. And what they talk about is wafer yield. So we're gonna talk about wafers in a minute, but you build these chips upon wafers that are larger than the size of the actual CPU. So you make multiple CPUs or other objects per wafer. But a lot of times these wafers have yields that are pretty poor, like 50% or less, which means that you're tossing half of these wafers that you're making. And if you have that low of a yield rate, it's going to cost a lot of money and a lot of wasted time because you're just throwing away these wafers that don't actually work out. So basically with each new foundry and each new technology, there's a lot of time and effort put into making the yields come up to some sort of acceptable standard. And one of the interesting aspects of this is that the benefits of each new reduced size is actually shrinking. So you're spending a ton of money to go from like 10 to seven nanometers, but the advantage of going from 10 to seven is not that gigantic. And so it's a lot of money being thrown at very, very small advantages. So actually in an odd way, there's a competitive advantage to sticking with the older sizes. It's assured people know how to do it and many of the basic components we need like ECUs, communication chips, DSPs, et cetera, et cetera, work just fine at older and bigger die sizes. And actually they're more robust in some cases too because the die is bigger. Additionally, three companies really, Intel, Samsung, and TMC, make up half the market by revenue. So if there's any kind of hiccup with any of these companies, there's a massive ramification to the entire market. And of course, these are the companies that are really pushing the boundary, right? It's Intel, Samsung, and TMC that are pushing down to like the seven and five nanometer processes right now. A lot of the other companies don't care so much. Although I would say that Nvidia that makes up one of the other half of the companies is pushing these smaller die sizes for performance purposes, but they actually are not that big by revenue. Another factor is that these super small FinFET structures are best for high performance computing, not energy efficient computing, which may make your ears perk up because you might think to yourself, wait a second, both Apple and Tesla are very, very concerned about energy efficient performance, not just performance at any cost. 
And so obviously there is some relationship to why Tesla and Apple have done okay in terms of this global chip supply shortage, whereas other companies have been brutally affected by it. And then of course there's wafer size, which is the size of the actual silicon platter upon which these units are cast. So if you think about it, you've got something like this, they're usually kind of rounded shape and I'll put a picture up, but basically you make multiple CPUs or whatever other thing, GPUs or whatever other thing you're trying to manufacture on one of these wafers. And the size of the wafer determines how many of these CPUs or GPUs or other ASICs or anything like that that you can put on one of these wafers. So 300 millimeters for the wafer size is the new standard, but it turns out there's not as much of an advantage to this as people thought due to the larger size. And it's a bear to get the yields up on something this large. So to some extent, the 300 millimeter wafer size is a bit of a fail so far. And so with a lot of foundries going to this newer size, that has actually caused problems because they're not yielding as many chips as they thought they were going to based on projections. So we've got construction issues, but then on the other side of this, basic economics here, is demand. No longer is it just computers, but cars and gaming consoles like the PS5 and 5G phones and all the IoT devices like Alexa and smart plugs and smart lights and smart refrigerators and smart toasters, etc, 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 all need chips to operate today. And that, of course, is a massive problem. If you've got this much supply and all of a sudden your demand goes from this to this, you've got problems. And then there is chip hoarding. If something's available, many companies buy as many of them as they can right away, screw everybody else. So that's a really big problem too, because of course, if the new chip, whatever it is, an airbag chip or something like that, becomes available in a quantity of, let's say, 10,000 or something, one company might just buy all 10,000 of those instantly, and then everybody else is out of luck. So again, we're back to very basic economics. We've got a supply and demand problem. The supply is very, very constrained, and the demand is ever, ever growing. And that combination is a bad combination in terms of creating this shortage. Interestingly enough, this demand has actually spurred construction of new 200 millimeter wafers rather than the 300 millimeter ones. And this is gonna help a lot, but 2023 is the earliest that these new foundries will be online. So we have about two years of these shortages still to come. And finally, let's talk about bad or short-sighted decisions. Most auto companies slashed chip orders last year when the pandemic made factories shut down and saw consumer demand fall off of a cliff. This was extremely short-sighted. As it turned out, foundries turned to making chips for other customers because they were still demanding chips. And those chips are now being manufactured at the facilities that used to make the automobile chips. Now, many of these chips are piddly little like $5 chips or something. But as Elon Musk said, you can grind production to a halt over a USB cable. And by the way, you can see my video on logistics if you're interested about that. So of course what will happen is eventually foundries will turn back again and recommence making chips for auto companies, but it's going to take months and months to transition back to that. In the meantime, everybody is pretty well screwed, except for companies like Apple and Tesla. In a moment, let's discuss why, but first, if you enjoyed this episode, please do like it so other people can find it, because that's how YouTube's algorithm works, and of course subscribe to see more of these. Also, as always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon, thank you all so much. Today we have an extra big new patron shout out. We have Norm Store, Mike Gaston, Dennis Kane, Cherian Olicara, Paul Henry, Tom G. Richardson, and Artsy. Welcome all of you, and of course if you out there want to join the fun, just check out the link in the description. Of course, don't forget about Webull, which is an awesome stock and cryptocurrency trading platform. You can click the link in the description, and if you open an account, you get one free stock valued at up to $250. And if you fund the account with $100, you get a second free stock valued at up to $1,600. So that's all pretty awesome. Definitely check out the link in the description and see how you can help out the channel. Definitely check out the link in the description and start a new account. Of course, don't forget about our merch store, which has Don't Mess With Tesla, All Input Is Error, many other t-shirts, and tumblers and mugs, etc. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping helps out the channel. Thank you. All right, so what is it about Tesla and Apple that makes them unique? As I said at the beginning, this is my opinion. Of course, this is not in the Extreme Tech article. So this is just me riffing on this. So blame me if I get this stuff wrong, not Extreme Tech. My first observation is that both Apple and Tesla were supply constrained during the pandemic, especially Tesla. 
So why did this matter? It means that Tesla and Apple never reduced their orders. They weren't sitting on extra inventory thinking like, oh my gosh, we're never gonna sell this stuff. Cut orders, cut orders, cut orders. They were like, we still are selling as many products as we can make, so we might as well keep on going with the orders. Of course, this is going to have a massive effect long-term as foundries were happy to crank out chips for these companies when others dropped orders. And now they're making them, of course, and didn't have to transition back again. Number two is that Tesla and Apple designed their own chips. This this is actually a huge factor in the reason why they're able to rise above this global chip shortage. Entire production lines are set up for inference engine hardware 3 and for Apple's A series and M1 chips for their phones and their computers. So as these were specialized chips and they had very specific orders for these, again, they weren't just commodity chips out there. The foundries just kept cranking out these chips during 2020. And of course they can keep doing so now as there's no transition time needed. And the third big thing is logistics. <laughs> Elon Musk said quarter one 2021 was the worst for logistics ever. And yet they were able to continue to produce more cars and sell more more cars than ever before. If Apple and Tesla design their own chips though, why does it matter about logistics? Well, they still rely on a lot of commodity chips as well as their specialized ones. They have DSPs, they have airbag ASICs, they have 5G chips, they have motor controllers, lots and lots of chips. So they have a good number of commodity chips as well as the very important sort of central processing units that they design themselves. But because these companies have excellent logistics people and very smart programmers, they've transitioned to using whatever chips are available and I know for a fact that Tesla actually has rewritten firmware code on the fly to make all of these new chips work. So in short, the fact that they were supply constrained meant no backing off on orders during the pandemic. The design of their own chips has reduced the need for commodity chips and agile logistics means the ability to pivot to whatever's available and not get stuck waiting on one small part. These factors are why the likes of Tesla and Apple have managed to continue ramping production while nearly all other manufacturers, especially auto manufacturers, have had to cut production drastically, all over little inexpensive chips that turn out to be pretty darn critical. Foresight and a bit of good luck means that players like Tesla and Apple will only continue to grow in the next year or so while other companies are contracting. All right, I hope you found this episode fun and informative. If you did, please do remember to like and subscribe. And in the meantime, please feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.